The case of the missing hunters has become local legend in Michigan. In November 1985, two young deer hunters vanished in the North Woods without a trace. No bodies, no bones, no blood. It was a mystery that haunted detectives and family members for 13 years. The killers came from a menacing northern Michigan family straight out of a gothic tale by William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, or Carson McCullers. For years, the Duval brothers bragged about how they had murdered the hunters, put their bodies through a shredder, and fed them to their carnivorous hogs. Friends, family, and former abused lovers of the two brothers were silenced by terror for more than a decade until one brave soul decided to speak up. Welcome to Michigan Crime Stories. Michigan Crime Stories is a podcast that explores murder, mysteries, and mayhem in the Mitten State. Criminal behavior has always enthralled us. It's when societies determine what is and isn't allowed. We assume heinous crimes are committed by monsters, individuals we dehumanize in an effort to make sense of their deeds. Their victims sometimes seem distant, just faded names in a passing headline. But the terrifying truth is that crimes are committed by ordinary people just like you and me. And many of those crimes happen right in our own backyard. My name is Darcy Moran. And this is John Counts. We're reporters for MLive.com and your hosts for Michigan Crime Stories. This episode is titled, Pigs Gotta Eat Too. To understand this story, you have to understand northern Michigan. Michigan's distinctive cultures are defined by geography. Southern Michigan is where the state's big cities are. Grand Rapids, Lansing, Ann Arbor, Detroit. Head north, roughly above the latitude of Clare, and the woods begin. Vast forests and empty spaces between small, sparsely inhabited towns and villages. Places to disappear. There are a few hardy souls who eke out livings in northern Michigan, but their numbers are much smaller than the urban areas of the south. Go up over the Mackinac Bridge into the Upper Peninsula, and there is even emptier land, wilder terrain, less people, and sharper cultural distinctions. There is a certain type of character who roams the remoteness of these north woods a distinctly American character. Think the restless freedom-seeking of Huck Finn combined with the lawlessness of Billy the Kid. Northwood's scofflaws who defy authority. Men and women who'd rather get drunk and stay drunk than go to work and pay their taxes. These are not the heroes of this particular story. They're the villains. To understand this story, you also have to understand deer season in Michigan. It's practically a holiday. School children in parts of northern Michigan still get the day off for the opener in mid-November. Thousands of hunters pack up their rifles, long underwear, a pint of schnapps, and flock to the cold woods to get their buck. That's exactly what two downstate guys did in 1985. David Till and Brian Ogin were best buddies from Eastside Detroit. They kissed their significant others goodbye, packed up a Bronco, and hit the road for deer camp one November, never to return home again. Their plan was loose. The men weren't particularly serious deer hunters. Many hunters who head north in November aren't. Instead, deer season in Michigan is generally known as a time when men get away from their responsibilities, head north to cut loose a little. As far as lodging, the friends had options. They could stay at a Till family deer camp in White Cloud on the west side of the state, or Ogin's family cottage on Higgins Lake, or with a high school friend who was living in the Mayo area of northeast Michigan. A meticulous police investigation would later determine the two ended up in the Mayo area, bar hopping more than hunting. Only the two dead men knew why and how their plans changed. They were still in their 20s, footloose and fancy free, away from work and women. Later eyewitness accounts determined Till and Ogin didn't spend their last days behaving like gentlemen. There was drinking, there was bad behavior in bars with women, and then they vanished. After November 24th, 1985, the men were never seen or heard from again. It was initially handled as a missing persons case by downstate police. Many thought the men had just disappeared on a bender and would show up sooner or later. But days turned into weeks and the two hunters were still missing. 
The police turned to the media, who got the word out that a manhunt was on for Till and Ogin. Flyers featuring their pictures were plastered in bars and sheriff's departments from Lake Huron to Lake Michigan. Police soon had a timeline of the last known whereabouts of Till and Ogin. The friends drove from Ogin's house in St. Clair Shores to Mayo, a small northern Michigan outpost on the banks of the Asable River. The river, one of the state's best-known blue-ribbon trout streams, attracts upscale fly fishermen throughout the spring and summer. Mayo itself, however, is anything but upscale. The gritty little town is the county seat for sparsely populated Oscoda County, surrounded by the Huron National Forest and the Osable State Forest. Witnesses recalled seeing Till and Ogin misbehaving at Mayo area taverns in the days leading up to their disappearance. The downstate deer hunters got cut off at one bar for being too drunk and trying to hit on women. The friends were last seen at Linker's Lost Lodge Bar on Sunday night, trying to cop a feel on a woman playing pool. The woman would one day be the star witness at the trial for their murders. If the Duval brothers were as good as keeping their mouths shut as they were at disposing of bodies and vehicles, they'd probably be free today. Instead, they're serving life terms in the Michigan Department of Corrections. In the end, their braggadocio caught up with them. For several years, police didn't really have a clue what happened to the deer hunters, not until J.R. and Coco Duval came onto the radar. The cold case attracted the attention of the media, not just the local papers, but the big downstate Detroit newspapers and television stations. It was even featured on the national television program Unsolved Mysteries. Police were happy to get the word out. Anytime a big outlet did an anniversary story, they would get tips. And detectives got a lot of tips over the years, the majority of them dead ends. They interviewed hundreds of people. Everyone in northern Michigan seemed to know a little something about the missing hunters. Or knew someone who knew. Or knew someone who overheard someone talking about it. The case was rife with rumor. The mystery was gathering the power of myth. One narrative that kept cropping up, however, involved two brothers, Raymond Duval, known as J.R., and Donald Duval, known as Coco, a couple of bad dudes from a criminally inclined family. The brothers lived part-time in Monroe County by the Ohio border and in backwood trailers on property in northeast Michigan, near Mayo. The sprawling Duval clan included dozens of brothers, sisters, and cousins, many of whom would be interviewed by police in the ensuing years. All of them were too loyal or too scared to snitch. J.R. and Coco were some of the worst in the bunch. They were known drunks and wife beaters, deer poachers and bar brawlers. The brothers were also handy with weapons and cars, specifically chopping them up so authorities couldn't track the parts. A few years after the hunters disappeared, the Duvals were heard bragging about how they'd killed the hunters. Dozens of family and friends were gathered at a bar in Wixom for a birthday party. There was drinking and dancing. Fueled by booze, the Duvals told a story about the missing hunters that many people overheard. The brothers talked about how they'd taken care of the hunters, and then fed them to the pigs. Pigs gotta eat too, they would tell people. Sometimes the Duvals would mean it as a threat too, as in if you talk to the police, we'll feed you to the pigs like we did those two hunters. You can't prosecute someone based on rumor though. For years, police searched the North Woods for any physical evidence, but found nothing. They searched numerous lakes and ponds for the Bronco. They brought in helicopters, cadaver dogs, and ground-penetrating radar devices. Nothing. With no physical evidence to go on, investigators had to rely on what people told them. Detectives were pretty sure they had the right guys, though, and wanted to see where they could get with the circumstantial evidence. A grand jury convened by the Attorney General's office declined to indict the brothers, however. The case went dormant. For years, it was one of Michigan's most notorious cold cases. Police checked out leads as they came in, but there wasn't any significant progress until a detective tracked down Barb Boudreau, a local Mayo party girl who later testified to having around nine drinks the night of the murder. But it's what she saw after the hunters left the bar that helped convict the Duval brothers. The woman was too spooked to tell police anything right away, though. It took years for detectives to coax her out of her shell of fear. She was terrified of the Duval brothers, who made it known that they'd inflict bad things on anyone who talked to police. Boudreaux eventually summoned the courage to tell the full story. 
She'd been at the bar celebrating with a friend, a Northwoods poacher like the Duvals who'd bagged his first legal buck. They were playing pool when she had contact with the soon-to-be missing hunters. The little one, Ojin, allegedly grabbed her butt. The tall one, Till, rubbed himself up against her while she was bent over shooting pool. Boudreaux told her friends they needed to get their asses kicked. Then the Duval brothers showed up. They told her not to worry about it. They'd take care of the hunters. What started the beef between the Duvals and the two hunters was never precisely nailed down. One version went that the hunters beat up one of the brothers at a different bar, and the brother went and got a crew of buddies who caught up with the deer hunters at Linker's. Another version went that Till and Ojin got into an argument with the Duvals in the woods earlier in the weekend over who shot and killed a dead deer. Regardless of how it started, the Duvals would be the ones to end it, according to Barb Boudreau. Boudreau, who lived down the road from the bar, went home knowing there'd be trouble between the hunters and the Duvals. Boudreau was watching a movie, Scarface with Al Pacino, when she heard a pinging noise outside. She and her friend crept out to see what was going on. She testified that the Duvals and a few other guys had the hunters in a snowy field, the headlights from the Bronco illuminating the scene. She said she saw Coco beating the tall one till with a bat or a metal pipe, the source of the pinging noise. Coco took one big swing at his head. Boudreaux described the sound as a pumpkin or some other kind of gourd exploding on concrete. The small one, Ojin, broke free and tried running. The Duvals and their friends caught him and mocked him for pissing his pants. Then they beat him to death, too. Boudreaux went back home. The Duvals showed up later in the night. They gave her a warning. Pigs gotta eat, too. A jury deliberated only two hours after a long trial to convict the Duvals of murder, despite a lack of any kind of physical evidence. As the defense attorney argued, since the bodies were never found, Till and Ojin could have run off to Hawaii for all anyone knew. The Bronco was never found. Neither were any of the hunter's possessions. Since the conviction, the case has become an indelible part of Michigan's criminal history. Many television shows and books have covered the territory, including Tom Henderson's Darker Than Night, a true crime book published in 2006, three years after the conviction. Much of the information in this podcast comes from Henderson's thorough book, as well as other media reports over the years. Hi, this is Darcy Moran with Michigan Crime Stories, and I'm sitting here with John Counts, who reported this story. Can you, uh, just to start out with, I mean, this is a pretty grisly story we're, we're hearing about today. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the pigs that they mentioned here. Where, what are their sets? Whatever happened with those pigs? Were they found to actually be carnivorous? So it's unclear whether the victims in this case were actually ever fed to the pigs. I, um, the brothers did own these pigs, and whether or not that they were carnivorous and they fed body parts to them, that's you know, kind of uh, folklore and, and legend at this point. Um, they did have, or they were known to feed meat to their pigs, and I'm no farmer, and I, you know, I don't exactly know what pigs eat, but I'm pretty sure you know, they eat slop, you know, that kind of stuff, whatever's left over in the kitchen. But if you feed them uh, meat, I guess they get the taste for meat, and more or less these two brothers were using it as, as a threat and uh, to sort of build up their reputation and scare people. Now, when you were learning about this case, what was the family reactions? Because, you know, the, the carnivorous pigs and all that aside, what was described by the witness was really a, a terrible and painful death for these two hunters. Um, what were the family reactions in, in court to all of this? You know, I think everybody was so scared of these brothers and so scared to come out to, to, to speak out that you know they they didn't for for 12 13 years and it took uh the michigan state police a, a particular detective um bronco lesneski uh was the one who got this woman to speak and to actually finally testify so i think fear was sort of the prevailing uh mood of the, the courtroom there and for the family of the two hunters i mean was there any information on that their reactions um, yeah, I mean, they were they were um, happy to have some sort of closure in the case finally, and uh, you know, it, it I guess suppose it allowed them to move on a little bit. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, from from uh, the book that I read about this by by Tom Henderson, you know, the 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 trial itself was a pretty uh, sensational ordeal and probably well worth uh, taking a look at, at his book or, you know, I'm sure you could uh, dig up the, the trial transcripts if you're so inclined. So one thing you noted, this took over a decade to solve. And uh, the way you described it, this region, um, it sounded, you know, fairly spread out, but a close knit community. And I'm curious uh, what you know about how the region reacted to just this lingering, you know, unsolved death there and the reactions afterwards to it finally being solved. So, you know, I grew up going up to the Mayo area as a kid to, to fly fish a lot, and I'm pretty familiar with, with, with that whole general region. And this is, this is something, you know, I was born in the late 70s, and this case was pretty much ongoing throughout my entire life. And it's a case that I knew of that I'd always heard of. And uh, that's part of the reason why I was attracted to it and just wanted to kind of learn more about it. And, you know, the northern Michigan is a pretty rural area and it's got its sort of clannish tribalisms there up there to it. And, uh, you know, it was this case was something that everybody talked about for for many years and, and, uh, you know, kind of hung over, it sounded like. Yeah, exactly. And so you're pretty well familiar with the area then. Um, I mean, is this something that it seems like it shocks the minds of anyone, but particularly in this region, is there a lot of crime? No, there's not. I mean, there's just not that many people up there. So something like this happening, um, you know, it's it's every downstate hunter's like greatest nightmare is going up into the woods to go hunting and then just disappearing. So it's kind of made the, the story made its rounds because this kind of stuff generally doesn't happen up there. You know, in northern Michigan, you get your bar fights, you get your domestic disputes and all that kind of stuff. But but, um, you know, you don't generally get murdered or hear about such sort of grisly murders like this. Well, it's an interesting story, John. Thank you so much for uh, telling it to us. I'm Darcy Moran. And I'm John Counts. And we are Michigan Crime Stories. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned to Michigan Crime Stories for more episodes of mystery, murder, and mayhem in the Mitten State.